Welcome to Essential Leadership Skills. Today we will be learning from TEDx speaker Dr. Deborah Hirsa. Would you like to rethink the aging process, maybe even slow the process down? Have you ever longed for having more energy and the wisdom to be a great leader? Join our Director of Operations Glenn Daniels as we learn from Dr. Deborah Hirsa, founder and CEO of The Mentor Project and applied developmental psychologist with a specialty in aging. This is a Touchstone Publishers presentation, your trusted source of leadership knowledge. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's go. This is going to be another one of those information-filled events today. Uh, we got something that close to me because of how old I'm getting, but we'll get there. But first thing I want to ask, Dr. Deborah, did they pronounce your name right? Your last name. It's actually Deborah Heiser. Heiser. Okay, so we debated that, and I said I think it's Heiser should know us. Okay, so. I'm glad you corrected that for us. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you for having me. It's a real privilege. Well, it's a real privilege to get with people who have a passion for what they're doing. And so we all can learn from them. I do have probably 2000 questions for you, but I decided to just ask three and then have you I'll ask, ask more questions based upon your answers. But the first question I want to ask you is, what is it about you, your TEDx talk, or your organization that is unique or powerful that people just need to know about? Maybe they don't really see it on the surface. What is it about you or TEDx or your organization that's unique and powerful? I think that the unique aspect of all three of them is that we look at mentorship from the perspective of the mentor as opposed to the mentee. So we are looking, and I, my personal passion and interest is looking at how people who give back, what do they get? What exactly are they receiving? And why is it so important for us to leave our legacy and our footprint on the world? So that mm -hmm. is a unique aspect of everything that I'm doing personally with my organization, the Mentor Project, and what is talked about in the TEDx talk. Well, that is completely, almost completely reversed from a lot of other folks, a lot of other folks is building this, the mentorship for the mentee. You're saying, okay, if you're gonna be a mentor, what are you gonna get from that? That's powerful, I like that quite a little bit. Your TEDx talk is kind of a making you stop and think about things, um, making you kind of say, okay, what is going on in my life as I age or as I lose stride and things like that? So I'd like to ask you, what was your journey like from the time you decided you wanna do the TED talk to the time you actually were on stage. And also let's add another piece of it. What was it like when you first got inspired for the subject? What was that journey like all the way up to the time you got up on the stage? Um, well, I, I was inspired by the topic um, a couple of years before the TED, TEDx talk. Um, my area of interest is looking at how we age successfully. How do we develop? as human beings and how do we uh, go through life um, learning and growing and developing. So yeah. I had been having discussions with people who kept saying, we have nothing to look forward to as we age. What can you possibly have to tell me or to research or talk about that's positive about aging? And what I was able to find was that in fact, most of us look at aging in a trajectory that goes up very rapidly you know as we physically age we gain the ability to walk talk then run move faster gain all of these physical um advantages and then there's a slow steady decline for the rest of our lives and most people look at that as very scary and what i wanted to do in the is to tell people about our emotional journey so we have an emotional ability which starts at zero, just like we do with our physical ability, and it increases throughout our lifespan. It never decreases. Okay. Now, I found that interesting in your actual talk, and you had the chart up to show the physical and how it kind of slides down, but yet the emotional kept on going up. That was a very interesting point, and you made a, the point that I want to have you maybe carry on just a little bit more, that emotional ability carries on. What does that really mean? Well, that means that as we, as just think of yourself, how you are now, are you the same person that you were when you were two or five 
mm-hmm. or seven? Mm-hmm. Do you solve the problems the same way? Do you throw yourself on the floor in the grocery store if you don't have what you want, if they don't have what you want? No, but when you were two, that would have been maybe expected. Throughout our lifespan, we are always developing and growing and maturing emotionally. We often don't even think about it. We, we don't ever consider how we were emotionally when we were younger and how we are now. We just roll with it. But really, what we're doing this whole time is building up coping skills and coping mechanisms for leading happier lives. So by the time we hit midlife, we're happier than we were when we were teenagers. We're happier than when we were in our 20s. So from 50 on, we can expect to be happier. And that's because of all the emotional growth that we've been developing over our lifespan. And that's what is so important to know about. Well, now here's what I had a little bit of a challenge with. We could possibly be happier, but our society, our culture, everything is set up to say we're over the hill after 40. And we shouldn't be happy. We're, I mean, if you look at all the television shows and commercials mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, the top, you know, the top 30 people under 30, they talk about them. Yeah. How do we combat that as people over 50 to kind of say, it's cool. I don't care what they say on TV. You know, interestingly, despite all of that, we're still happier. Oh, really? Um, yeah. And so imagine if we changed how we really think about aging just imagine how we how we would all be feeling about ourselves then. Um, so even while this is all happening right now, as we speak with the media the way it is, with literature out there the way it is, and the value placed on being young and looking awesome at all times, yeah, yeah. that it, we are still happier in midlife. And I'll tell you, I'm in my I'm in my fifties. Do I care if I can run as fast as I did when? that I can't run as fast? No, I really don't. Do I care that I need reading glasses now? No. These are things that we accept as we get older and they don't matter so much to us. So this is something that um, surprises a lot of people is that- Yeah. We well, and I, th- I think in a way I can see that because you kind of don't worry so much about what other people are saying or thinking yeah. or doing. So that kind of makes you happy. And that's why we can expect to be happier as we grow older. Absolutely. Despite, yeah. So I think that's a very good point you brought up in your TEDx. Now I have a question for you that's going to kind of break this up a little bit. But when you said this, I mean, it just cracked me up. Why do people run from you? At least sometimes. Well, <laughs> I, you know, in the TEDx talk I talked about, and it's true, how I dread cocktail parties and especially especially I used to when I was an aging researcher. I dread them because when people ask me what I do and I introduce myself and I say I'm I'm an aging specialist, their eyes glaze over. You know, they start to think, oh my goodness, you can see their eyes darting around the room just looking for anyone to help them to make the greatest, (laughs) the most boring person in the world. Like that is the last person people want to be trapped with is an aging specialist at a cocktail party. Well, now, that is probably the last person, but then by the time we get through with the TEDx, by the time you get through with your talk, and then by the time I hopefully get through today, people say, let me go find her. Um, and if they find you to go through the mentoring project, what does that do for them? Uh, you, the, it's called the Mentor Project. And what we do is we bring all of the top experts in the world in fields in STEM, arts, um, in, uh, finance, business, and law, and we bring these individuals um, to give back to the to kids for free, K through university. Um, we do this globally, and this started because um, some of the mentors, Bob Cousins, who's the person who patented how we use credit cards in the internet, and Bill Cheswick, who is the person who was one of the fathers of the firewall. They both mm-hmm. said, "Hey." We'd love to give back, but it's hard to find mentees. And I never thought it thought of it from that perspective. But Bill came to me and he said, I'd love to give back to kids in schools, but I'll look like a weirdo if I start approaching kids saying, hey, do you want to learn quantum mechanics? And I said, yes, yes indeed you would. Please don't do that. And yes. so we started it 
the mentor project because we found so many people with world experts, people who've changed the world could not find mentees. And so I realized that there was a problem and we needed to flip the switch on how we looked at mentorship and look at it from the point of view of the mentor. And so that's how it, it really got started. I was a little bit surprised by the statement that mentoring benefits the mentor as much as or more. Why do the, the two gentlemen you named, what was their benefit? And said they wanted to do it, but what was their benefit for doing it? There were a couple. First of all, imagine, you know, you are an expert in a field and okay. there's you, you've retired or you are, you know, at a, at a point where you're not involved with as many younger people. You, a person can start to feel irrelevant or you know you have this expertise and people are going back and reinventing the wheel over and over. Mm. You can help. It's also a legacy that you're, you're able to leave. You're able to make the mark on the on the world that you want to. So at a certain point, we all start, mm. we stop checking off the boxes saying, okay, I did this, I did this, I've, I've done, jumped through this hoop. They've done all of that. Now the next thing they wanna do is shape the world the way that they want to. They wanna say, I mattered. And that's why, the benefit to them is so much more than a mentee. A mentee is saying, open the door for me. And they're saying, I have a door to open for you. Now let me watch your life change. That's powerful. That is, that is. And when you were doing your TEDx, I started thinking about Maslow hierarchy of needs. Um, that's related to these mentors who want to give back, right? They reach that top level, the self-actualized person, and they reach that level. Um, what do you think about that? That's just something that just hit me in my mind while you you're, were talking in your TEDx. You're right on. It's exactly it. It's a it's a point where you're you're past all of the other levels. You know, you've got your safety taken care of. You have your food and your shelter. You have your friends. You have everything else. And now it, you're trying to um, really get to the highest level that you personally can. And that's really what this is all about. When you're at the point where you say, I'm like a bottle filled up with expertise, knowledge, skills, and values and all of that, you want to open it up and let it all out. That's really the self-actualization because then you can see it getting out there, okay. sharing it. Yeah. You know, um, I want to ask you, because this was such a, a profound subject to me, and I'm sure to people all in our age range on up, um, this ideal of mentoring and helping others become better as they're younger. But I want to ask you, when after you did this talk, how did that change your, your business, your life? Did it change your business for your life at all? It did. Um, I think that it really, not only for me, made it feel real, mm -hmm. right? I said, wow, okay, this is legitimate and real. It also allowed me to get that message out to other people. Because when I talk about mentorship, a lot of people were saying, yeah, yeah, there's a million mentor mentoring programs out there. And, but they were all approaching it differently than the way that we were. And so by having the TEDx talk, I was able to get the message out to show that it's important to look at mentorship from the point of view of the mentor. And mm -hmm. that was the then when people were able to see that, mentors started coming and saying, I want to mentor. I have this skill. I'd like to do that. And that opened the door for more mentors to come in as well and get involved. So the question I'm going to ask you, because it's kind of a side question, but how hard was it for you to get this talk down to 18 minutes? I mean, or, or less. I mean, that's the rule. I saw one or two people go past that. But as a rule, 18 minutes is it. That's you have a lot of information to share here. How would you narrow it down for this eighteen minutes? Well, it, mine was on, mine was eight. It was yes. supposed to be a little bit under eight, and it was like kicking and screaming the whole time to get it down to Wait that. Minute, hold on, hold it on. was that... not a pretty experience on my part because it, I really wanted to say so much. However, the coaches that I had were so good at just saying. Pare it down, pare it down, 
say it in fewer words, make it more concise. You know, you can have the message more powerful if you make it shorter. And so it was taking what I felt was such important stuff that I could have talked for hours about and bringing it down to under eight minutes. Well, certainly that sounds, I didn't realize that the TEDx was down to eight minutes. Wow, that was Not tough. everybody's was, mine was. Oh, Some okay. people had longer ones, um, but in the end, I was happier with the shorter TEDx talk because I really do feel like I was able to get the message across in that amount of time. Okay, and so that brings me to the second part of that question. Because you did pare it down to eight minutes, how much did that help you get your message out in a succinct way? I mean, did it really help? Absolutely. It made me think about everything in terms of how can I say this in a way that people will understand um, that is as concise as it possibly can be, where I could describe it in an elevator, like an elevator pitch, so to speak. Um, you know, really take like my life's work and thoughts and, and mm -hmm. put it into such a short amount of time. That was so helpful. It was really helpful to do that because I had to convey that to other people before they would approve it. And if it wasn't clear, they would say, no, 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 go back and fix that. And I had to do it or it wasn't going to work. It wasn't going to work. And and it helps on the other side of it too. You had two points. We've already talked about one that you can expect to be happier and get older. But I wonder if this one, we get more from giving than from receiving. Is that kind of a mission statement, a vision of your company? Or how does that fit into your question? Because you talked about it. If you want to put it in my mind. How, do you, how does that work out? You know, the old saying, tis better to give than to receive is actually true. It isn't just a saying that comes around at the holidays when you're supposed to go shop. It's really something that is actually um, shown in research that when we give back, we are built to give back. Um, developmentally, we go through stages in our lives, you know, where we are supposed to, you know, get connected with others, um, have intimacy, do all of these things. And then we hit a point where we're built to want to give back to others. And what we get from that is everybody knows when they go and they give a gift to someone, say it's it's the holiday time and you're giving gifts to children and you get to see the joy on the child's face. Who feels better? You do when you give when you're giving something. But the same is the case when you're giving back knowledge that's meaningful to you, to someone else, and you're able to see it help them or make a difference in their life. Knowing that you have an impact on someone else or the world is power that most of us don't get to experience very often. And you only get, get that when you're giving. Um, one of the things that I talk about in the TEDx talk is how you can see when that doesn't happen and that I call that the Ebenezer effect. So mm -hmm. if anyone knows of the Ebenezer Scrooge from Charles Dickens, the Christmas Carol, he was a self-made guy. He lived in a mansion. He had servants taking care of all of his needs and he was miserable. And it wasn't until he started giving back to others um, that, and getting closer with others and having meaningful connections that he actually felt joy. So when we hoard all of our um, our skills and values and all of our expertise, we don't get joy from that. We get joy when we share it with others, when we're giving it. And that's, that's what that, yeah. is. that And that feels like that runs through your message to everyone. Start giving and yeah. it comes back to you. Okay. you know, I want to also ask you real quick, what are you doing right now? to help people. I mean, tell, tell us about what you're doing right now. Yeah, we have the TEDx talk. I put the link up so everybody can go to that when they need it. And everybody should go to it. Um, but what are you doing right now to assist us age a little bit better? What, um, what we're doing to help people age better is that we are taking their expertise and their skills and we're putting them in positions where they can 
see it getting to others. So whether that's an ask me anything with kids in Argentina, whether that's a hackathon, whether that is helping a kid to get a patent, whether that's telling about their career in a school to little kids, no matter what it is, we're, we're helping our mentors to be able to leave their legacy or their footprint. And that's where we're able to see the difference. That's where we're helping people to age better. And I can tell you that our mentors love it. They wanna do more than we can find for them sometimes. They just really get a lot out of it. Well, the first two things that you mentioned stick there for some reason. Tell me about Ask Me Anything and a hacker marathon, uh, hackathon, I guess sure. it was. Um, tell us about that. And I bet you get some interest because I'm curious now. So an Ask Me Anything is we have set it up where one of our mentors will get on to a Zoom call. As soon as the pandemic hit, we needed to switch our model. Yeah. And Ask Me Anything is done often, oftentimes in a live setting as well. But it's where the expert is up on, on a stage or in a platform like this, and people are allowed to ask anything they want. So if you bring an astronaut and someone can ask anything they want, that's amazing for a kid. But hmm. mentors also get to hear in the voices of the kids and oftentimes the parents have the excitement of, wow, you did that? Oh, wow, I just learned something new. So we've had cybersecurity experts talk about cybersecurity. We've had mentors talk about rocketry. We've had mentors talking about um, um, astrophysics, all kinds of things. Oh, and banking. Um, and the, the, it's just um, the most amazing feeling for the mentors. It's obviously, we all know that the mentees get something out of it, but the mentors feel pretty awesome too. Because, you know, if you think about it, mentors are often hanging out with other experts. And when you're talking with somebody who's an expert in your field, it, it isn't as exciting as when you get to tell that information to someone who's never heard it before. It's really, it makes you feel really good about what you've been doing all over again. That's why I, I was excited about this field. Look, I can see the excitement yeah. on somebody yeah. else's face. When you're with a peer at work, you don't get that same, you know, you're just getting your job done or you're talking about things that you're both really good at that are similar. It's when you get to show it to someone who doesn't have that view that it becomes really exciting. It and, does, and I can see where that mentor wants to give. Yeah. He wants okay. to give that knowledge. And that, and that becomes a very powerful, healthy way to take your wisdom and put it out there. Yes. And the hackathon that you talked about is where we've taken kids from different countries. So we've had two separate hackathons where one was with kids from Argentina and the US and we merged them. They hadn't met before. We merged the kids together hmm. and our mentors came together to work with the kids to solve big problems. So the kids who were working to solve problems had access to all these top mentors and their ideas ended up get it really moving much farther than they ever would have to solve problems because they had world experts guiding them saying, don't go down that path, try this or something like that. Um, and then we did a, another follow-up one a few months later with um, kids from Argentina, the US and um, Siberia, school in Siberia. Wow. And they all also got to solve problems. And so the kids that were in the second one called the Maskathon, they're working with mentors to write journal articles in, peer in a peer reviewed journal out of Australia. They are doing all kinds of really cool work um, to get their messages out and podcasting. And from the first hackathon that we had, um, the kids are, they're looking at getting their their ideas patented. Um, and two white papers, I think, went out based on, oh. on their, yeah, so real things happened because they had um, really amazing people guiding them. What an amazing opportunity to give back because you know something real could happen from that. Yeah. That's absolutely true. Well, it's powerful. Let me also ask you the real quick about this statement that you made. I would like to ask you, 
why you made it, and what is it. So the other way around, what is the most precious resource, and why did you why do you say that? I keep hearing all the time about all all sorts of resources that we are, you know, that are becoming, that are so precious to us. I've heard about diamonds, right? I, that comes up in media all the time, oil, coal, gas, all these resources. And I thought to myself, no, no, we're wasting one of our most precious resources, which is us. We're wasting the minds and the expertise and the knowledge and the skills of our older adults. When they yeah. retire, no one sees them again. Yeah. Uh, let's get rid of those noises. <laughs> so um, the, that resource you say is us then? The resource is us. It's everyone from grandmas to, you know, astronauts. You know, the, most people don't realize the power of, you know, grandparents even and how they're yeah. our most precious resource. If you think of religion, if you think of how that's been passed down from generation to generation, it's passed down through families, it's passed down through traditions, through cultures, all of those things. We would not have the continuity that we have if it weren't for parents and grandparents and um, religious leaders and, and everybody else doing that. We think of science as the main thing, but it's really, if we think about the things that we hold dear to ourselves right now, it's our grandparents, it's other individuals who are in our community and our lives as well. No, on a previous episode, I heard it put very well, um, kitchen table wisdom means yes. more than science sometimes. Uh, it does, so, it does. Absolutely. I'd like to ask you if you can tell us real quick. Um, and it doesn't have to be quick. You can just tell us the Mentor Project. What you kind of already laid it out what it is, but I want people to get a hold of you. So here's your commercial. Tell us about what it is, how it benefits, and how people can get a hold of you to participate. Sure. Well, you can certainly come to our website. It's www mentorproject.org. You can find us on social media, on Facebook. We are The Mentor Project. On LinkedIn, The Mentor Project. On Twitter, Mentor Project. Instagram, Mentor Project. <laughs> if you go to any of those areas, you can find us. Um, what we do is we are bringing mentors, top leaders in the world. If you look at our website, you can get a list of our mentors. We, it, we're continuing to grow and grow our mentor list. But if you have an interest in any area, you can reach out an email and we will get a question answered. You can ask any one of our mentors a question. If you say, hey, I'd like to see this mentor in my school for an ask me anything, we can arrange that. We can work on that. What we do though, is we bring, we make our leading experts in the world accessible to kids around the world for free. There's no charge for this. So we bring programs into schools. Um, right now we're in Robeson County, North Carolina, and we um, just finished a partnered project with um, Embedded Ventures where uh, they taught online how to do how to build an 8-bit computer. And wow. we're going to be bringing more programming in this fall from leadership skills to um, diversity and inclusion to um, we're bringing um, a, a new program that we're gonna be starting geospatial uh, work and bringing in drones and bringing in Raspberry Pi development so that students can get an opportunity to learn some of the things that they might not have exposure to. Wow. We're bringing this to Tanzania. We're already in, doing uh, programs with kids in Argentina, um, all across the United States. Um, we do Ask Me Anything. We do um, hackathons a couple of times a year. Kids reach out to us all the time for one-on-one -on -one mentorship. Some of our mentors have picked up mentees and they've been uh, in a one-on-one -on -one sort of relationship mentoring for mm. more than a year. 
And these are people who never would have had the opportunity to meet someone in Silicon Valley if they're in a completely different location. So sure. we're working that gap. So, and as thought came to me, so this mentoring program is also, I mean, there's a lot of benefit for the mentor, but for the kids, that starts problem solving skills and being able to uh, critically think through issues. Just, I mean, just the, the two that we talked about, um, ask me anything and the hackathon, those two start those problem solving. So you're kind of getting it covered from every angle, I believe. Yes. And you know, I'm glad you brought that up because we start very young. One of our really cool programs is a puppetry program for little kids, for kids who are even younger than kindergarten or kindergarten. Um, they like it even older as well. Um, but we have a puppeteer who teaches, it's teaching really DIY maker uh, projects. Uh, so she teaches how to make the puppets from household items while she tells a story. And so kids are learning how to do building and making. And that's one of the key things is to get kids started to enjoy learning and making and doing at a very young age, because it never really changes beyond that, uh, that first beginning idea of how do you put things together to make something new. Um, you can find her as well as um, all of our other mentors on our podcasts as well. We're on iTunes, Spreaker, Spotify. Um, we have a meet your mentor that way. And we have her um, puppetry on there as well. Um, so the kids can get to see and hear and learn in new ways. Wow. Wow. Tell us the name of your podcast. It's called The Mentor Project. Oh, the podcast is The Mentor Project. Okay, so we're good. Okay, so that's up there. The Mentor Project, the podcast. Great, great. I want to be respectful of your time. So I want to ask you maybe the hardest question. What question should I have asked you that I didn't? Uh, let me think. I don't know. You're really good. So I don't think, I don't know that you missed anything. Um, the only thing I could think of maybe is how schools can contact us and how organizations can contact us who want to get involved. And to do that, they can just go to our website and fill out our contact form, or they can uh, email it at, at info at mentorproject.org. Okay. Great, great. So thank you very much for doing the work that you're doing. Uh, I think it looks like you're serving both ends, the wisdom keepers, if you will, and the young wisdom takers or needing. You know. So it looks like you're working both ends. I think that's really fantastic. Um, and the reason why I think it's really leaders, we have a lot of leaders out there who are our age range, and we're soon retiring out if we retire. Um, you could give back and feel so much better because that's what you want to do anyways, give. Mm -hmm. So why not get a hold of the Mentor Project and see what we can come up with. Any last words you'd like to share for us? I'd like to first um, say thank you to you. Um, I love what you're doing. I love that you're bringing the knowledge from TEDx Talks to everyone in a new way because you're going in depth. And I, I think that that's such an important thing that you're doing. And so I want to thank you for that. Well, you're welcome. I just know eight minutes is not long enough, but it's a, it gives you the ideal, but it's not long enough to really say what's how it can be a benefit. So thank you for that. All righty. So ladies and gentlemen, great topic once again. Thank you for connecting with us here at Touchstone Publishers. Please join our group Essential Leadership Skills and share your leadership knowledge with us all.